We are going to go into Revelation chapter 5 tonight. And uh, if you don't have a worksheet, uh, Pastor will be back next Wednesday night, and he probably will recover what I'm covering tonight and go a different direction with it. I'm going something specific that the Lord has been laying on my heart for some time that I want to talk to you about. And, and you know, some of it, we joke about it around here. You know, Pastor, he always wants to pump you up, and then I come in here and make you feel like, you know, I tell everybody, Pastor's job is to come in and encourage you. He comes in and he makes you think tomorrow's going to be a holiday and you're going to get cupcakes and ice cream. I come in and tell you the world's going to hell in a handbasket and you'll be in the soup line tomorrow. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is, it's probably somewhere in between those two, okay, amen? <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's just the difference in me and him and our anointings and what God uh, uses us for. So hopefully I won't discourage you too bad tonight, but... Uh, Go ahead and turn to Revelations chapter 5 with me tonight. Revelations 5. And I want to read the first seven verses here. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. We started out this book, I don't know, a couple months ago, three months ago now, Pastor did, We started out, he talked for a long time there in in chapters 2 and 3 about the churches, the seven churches. The book starts out, the prophecy, the revelation starts out here on earth, talking about things on the earth. But in chapter 4, a change takes place, and we find ourselves moving from earth to heaven. Now, Connor, we're not going to get I'm not going to throw grenades at you like Pastor does. You know, a pastor stands up here every week and acts like he's throwing his grenades at Connor. I thought about that. It's really not fair. You know, Connor can't take up for himself. Kind of reminds me of a hearing they've been doing in Washington here about January the 6th a little bit lately. But uh, <clears throat> did I say that out loud? I <laughs> did, didn't I? <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we won't go that route. We could get in a big rabbit hole there, couldn't we? But... Uh, Either, either by rapture or by vision, we've now moved from earth into heaven and we have a different viewpoint. While we were looking directly at things on earth, now we're looking at things that are happening in heaven that will affect the earth. So we, we've made this change. We got a glimpse last week, Pastor talked to us about the throne room and uh, some of the strange things that, that go on, you know, that we see there, some of the strange creatures and I kind of got a kick out of pastor saying, you know, I wonder if those angels are sitting there looking at me and you and say, boy, don't they look strange, you know? And I'm sure they probably do. But so we moved into the throne room. But tonight in chapter five, we actually are still in the throne room, but it's almost like we, we've been standing back and we've been looking at the whole room. And now our vision zooms in to a, a specific point in the room. A specific thing, if you will. We, we literally change. And, and in this chapter, we're about to learn some things that are going to change the face of the earth, literally and eternally. And so we, we zoom in, and what we see is we see a scroll. And this scroll is in the hand of the one who sits on the throne. It's in the hand of God. We zoom in on it. And it's not just any scroll. It's a scroll with seven seals. Now, that's, that's important. And Pastor will probably talk more about it next week, but let me tell you one reason it's important. 
In the day that John was writing this, a scroll with seven seals was not uncommon. If you saw a scroll with seven seals, it simply meant it was something special. In Jewish culture, the Jewish magicians, and yes, there were such things, the Jewish magicians would write their spells, their incantations, their things in a scroll, seal it with seven seals. That number seven is always special. I don't care where you go. In Roman culture, they would also have seven sealed scrolls. But mostly in Roman culture, they were legal documents that had seven seals, especially the last will and testament of someone. So your will would be written on a scroll, rolled up, and sealed with seven seals. And that meant this is it. This is the complete will and testament of whoever. And so this, this seven seal thing would have been very uh, common to John. Now, let's talk about this scroll for just a minute. One of the first things that you have to realize when you look at the scroll in Revelation chapter 5 is this. The scroll and the seven seals are the same yet different. Let me explain that. On this scroll, we have things written front and back. How did John know it was written on the back? He was just looking at it rolled up. Well, when you roll up a scroll, you only see the back, the way it rolls. So if he saw writing on what would have been the outside of the scroll, he knew that it was written on the front and the back. When you roll it up, you cannot read what's inside of it. Right? Makes sense? So then you have these seals. And these seals seal the scroll, but they are not part of the contents of the scroll. They are outside of those contents. In fact, the best way to look at these seals is to say that the, these seals show things that must happen before the contents of the scroll can be opened up. Right? Got to open the seals first. So the seals have to take place before what's in the scroll can be opened up and read. Now, here's an interesting point. Nowhere in the book of Revelations does, Don, does John tell you what's in the scroll. Nowhere. He opens the seven seals. We go through the seven seals, and then it goes right on into trumpets. Now, most scholars agree and assume that everything that happens after the seventh seal is what's in the scroll. <clears throat> but John never really tells us that I saw in the scroll or this came out or this was done from the scroll or whatever. So it's assumed, however, that the rest of Revelations comes from the scroll. So we see these seals removed in chapters 6 through 8. And Every time one of these seals is removed, something happens. Something is released on earth. The first four seals, we get the famous four horsemen of the Revelation. Everybody talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? The fifth seal, we see martyrs. The sixth seal, we see cosmic disturbances. The seventh seal, we actually have this period of silence in heaven, 30 minutes, half an hour. And, and there's all kind of conjecture out there as to what that's all about. I personally think that everybody, by the time the seventh seal was opened, everybody's just waiting for this scroll and to be unrolled and what's going to happen. But there's, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of that. What I want you to do with me right now is to look over to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 5. <clears throat> now, if you're not used to your Old Testament, it's the next to the last book in the Old Testament, okay? Zechariah 5. In just a moment, I'm going to read the first four verses. Zechariah, to me, was a lot like Ezekiel. Zechariah got a lot of visions, and he saw a lot of crazy things. Matter of fact, in the book of Zechariah, is the only place you will find what seems to be two female angels that are mentioned. At least they're women with wings, okay? So, he sees all these strange things. But now look at chapter 5, Zechariah, verse 1. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. 
And he said to me, this is the Lord that's speaking to him. He said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with its timber and stones. So <clears throat> Zechariah sees this scroll, and he says, the Lord tells him it's a, it's a scroll with curses. He says it's written on front and back. So it has some similarities to the one we've seen in the throne room. Some Jewish, Messianic Jewish scholars claim that it's the same scroll. that Zechariah saw it earlier, and now we're seeing it in heaven. I tend to agree with that. So this scroll that we see in Zechariah has curses on one side against thieves, curses on the other side against perjurers. But what gets me about this scroll, just as a side note, is the size of it. I want you to think about this for a minute. This scroll's huge. It's 20 cubits by 10 cubits. How many of you measured something in cubits today? Nobody. That's what I thought. Well, there are several definitions of cubit, but the main one is it's the distance from your elbow to the tip of your longest finger. Well, now, for some of us, that's longer than others. For me, it's about, I measured it today. It's about 20 inches, but I'm a big guy, right? Typically, when people are working with cubits, they use 18 inches because that's kind of an average. So a cubit's about 18 inches. So that means that this scroll, when unrolled, was 30 feet wide, 15 feet tall. Now, I want you to think about that. 30 feet wide, 15 feet tall. God's holding it in his hand. Does that tell you anything about how big God is? We're not talking about a little God sitting on a little throne. We're talking about a big God sitting on a big throne. And he's holding this scroll. It's 30 feet by 15 feet. Okay? I agree that this is probably the same scroll that we're seeing in Revelation 5 and Zechariah 5. We know that in Revelation 5, this scroll is, is curses because following the final seal, that's what we see is all these judgments and curses coming on the land, right? <clears throat> so here's the next question we need to ask ourselves. We see the, the throne. We see God on the throne. We see him holding this huge scroll. And then... The strong angel says, no one can open it. No one's worthy. Or to even look at it. And John then does something to me that is very strange. He weeps. Have you ever asked yourself why John was weeping? He doesn't even know what the scroll says. The seals are still there. He has no idea what's on the inside. And so he weeps. Well, there's a lot of reasons, I think. But the number one reason, I think he understood that this is the same scroll from Zechariah. And so you say, well, why was John weeping if curses are coming on the earth? <laughs> why would he do that? Let me tell you something about John. John was the longest living of any of the apostles. John had seen a lot. John had seen a lot of pain. He had seen a lot of persecution. In fact, if you go back and look at chapter 1, he's on Patmos for the word, preaching the word. He's being persecuted himself. He's literally in exile, in prison. John had seen a lot. He had seen his churches, the seven churches that we read about. John had probably been to every one of them. And he had seen the persecution and the martyrdom and all the things that were taking place. He knew Nero was the, the emperor at this time, and he was one of the worst ever on Christians. He had heard, he had heard of Christians being put in the Colosseum and 
the lions eating them, and he had seen all of this pain, all of this suffering. When you're treated unjustly, the first thing you want is justice. Justice. And if John understood that in this scroll was the justice of God about to be poured out on the earth, and yet here it is, nobody can open it, nobody can get into it, nobody can get this justice on the move, he weeps. He weeps for his people. But one of the elders steps up to him and says, don't weep. Look at verse 5, chapter 5, Revelations, verse 5 again. <clears throat> One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. That's exciting, isn't it? The lion of the tribe of Judah, he's prevailed, he can do it. And so John turns to look, well, where is he? But he didn't see a lion. He saw a lamb. Verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. Then he came and took the scroll. We go from this description of the lion of the tribe of Judah, and we go right into this description of the strangest thing I've ever heard of. This lamb as though it's been slain, seven horns, seven eyes. And we know a lot of this is symbolism. But have you ever thought about John turning and seeing a lamb that was slain? That wouldn't be a pretty sight. A lamb that's been slain is probably bloody. How else would he know he'd been slain? Mutilated, bloody. Not pleasant to look at in the least. But then he, and that tells us we know it was Jesus. He looks like a lamb that was slain, but he came and he took the scroll. And what follows this now as the lamb comes as Jesus comes and he takes the scroll and he begins to, to release these seals that we'll see in, a, in the near future. That definitely wasn't a pleasant sight to see. These horsemen, they go out into the earth, they wreak havoc, they kill, they bring death. We see martyrs under the altar. In fact, in the first three years, after these seals are open, half the population of earth dies. Half. Now, <clears throat> depending on your view of the rapture, that could be anywhere from three and a half billion down to about two billion. Billion with a B that die in those first three years. And you know, we, we say there are two billion Christians on earth. I don't believe that for a second. Those are just people that claim Christianity. I would say 15 to 20% of them are real. You say, well, how can you say that? Well, I can't. God only can. But if you really look, you can tell. You can see it. So 3 billion people are going to die in the next three years. That's pretty harsh. You know, when you stop and you think about the Bible, when you stop and you think about the Old Testament, a lot of the things that happened in the Old Testament during the conquest of Cana and the Promised Land, and even before that, when you stop and think about the biblical record, the New Testament, Revelations, the Bible is a very bloody book. If, if they really made a movie that shows everything in the Bible, they'd rate it R for violence even though they don't care if we do it in the streets, we just can't put it on the screen, right? Yeah. I'm going to have to stop that. I'm going to get in trouble. 
when you look at the judgments of the Old Testament and you see some of the things God did, here's Korah, he stands up against Moses and God just opens the earth and swallows tens of thousands of them. Here, David, all David does is counts the people when God told him not to, and I know there are reasons behind that, but was it 25,000, if I remember correctly? How I many? 70, I, thank you, 70,000. Just because David counted them. When you stop and think about it, the Bible's a bloody affair. The book of Revelation, half the population killed, a lot of them beheaded. Brutal times. In fact, the overriding feature of the book of Revelations is blood. It's one of the main things that's that's talked about, and it's used to represent death. We're going to have a battle, and the blood is going to run to the horse's bridle. I hope they're short horses. It's brutal. It's bloody. Why? This is the question I ask. And maybe you guys are better than me. Maybe you're holier than me. Maybe you don't ask this question, but I have. Why? God, why do you have to be so brutal? Why Why is God's response to those people who choose evil Why is it so harsh? After all, they're deceived. And maybe you've never thought of this. I have to be honest. Sometimes you wonder, or I have in past, not anymore, but in the past I've wondered, is God just some psychopathic maniac that sits on the throne and wants to strike everybody down. He's just mad because people won't believe in him and follow him. It's easy to see why people ask those kinds of questions when you start looking at all this, isn't it? And it's a hard question to answer. How do we take all of this harshness, this blood and judgment and all of this, how do we take all of that and how do we hold that up next to a a loving God and get the two to to fit? You ever thought about that? I know I'm not the only one that thinks about things like that. How do we do that? How do we balance the harshness with the love? Maybe, maybe, That's exactly how we do it, is we balance the harshness with the love. Let me try to explain that to you tonight. Go to Matthew chapter 24 with me. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is what I call the cliff notes to Revelation. Now, I might be be aging myself. I don't even know if you still have cliff notes today. You know, in my day, you know, you could when you were in high school, you had to read books, you know, and, and you had to do a book report. I never read those books. I went down to the bookstore and I bought that little book. It was about 15 pages called Cliff Notes on that book. And I could read that and know the basis of the story and answer most of the questions that would come out, right? Now, come on, guys. I know some of you did it too. So we get the Cliff Note version. Well, Matthew 24 is kind of the Cliff Note version of the book of Revelations. The disciples come to Jesus and they said, hey, tell us how all this is going in. He said, man, I don't have time to do all that now. Let me give you the cliff note version. So that's what he does. So look at Matthew 24. Uh, let's see. Let's look at verse 3. <clears throat> As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the, end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. You will be delivered up to tribulation, and you will be killed. If we were to look over in Revelations chapter 6, we won't turn there, we'll just... But if you look over in Revelations chapter 6, the fifth seal is open. And when the fifth seal is open, we see this scene under the, the throne, under the, uh, the altar. And it's martyrs. It's people that have died for Jesus or their faith. And these martyrs are crying out and they're saying, Lord, when will you avenge our death? And he says, not yet. He says, rest until the last one of your brothers that's supposed to die, dies. Then I'll do it. Martyrs. We don't think much about martyrs here in the United States. You might pick up a Voice of Martyrs magazine and read some stories. You think, isn't that terrible? You might... See a news story where some Christians were killed somewhere over there. It's always over there for us, right? We hear about people being persecuted, but not so much here. Well, wait a minute. You know that guy, I was standing at the water cooler one day. I mean, I was in the break room, and I was praying over my meal, and somebody laughed at me. I was persecuted. That's about the most persecution most of you have ever seen. We don't see it here. We see it other places. Did you know that it's been said that more people died in the 20th century for their faith in Jesus than the rest of the centuries up to then combined? Depending on which site you look at that tracks these things, and they... It's hard to tell because they use different definitions of persecution and martyrdom and so forth. But depending on which one you look at, one says every five minutes someone dies for their faith. One says every two hours. But I'd say somewhere in between. But even if it's one every hour, that adds up, right? In the U.S., we're insulated from it. You say, why are you going this route? Why are you? Because you're not going to be insulated much longer. <laughs> Did you know that 80% of the world's countries, I think there's 195 today, it changes every day. 80% of that 195, 80% of the world's countries, in some way, interfere with the free practice of Christianity. Some worse than others. 80%. In 52 of those 195 countries, it is outright illegal to be a Christian, to have a Bible, to meet as a church, to pray, whatever. Right now, while we sit in this church tonight, the estimated number is that 360 million Christians are being persecuted. <laughs> there again, depends on your definition of persecution. But it's a lot more than being laughed at for praying over your meal. While we, <laughs> while we sit in here tonight and you're just trying to stay awake and hope I'll hurry up and finish so you can get home early. <laughs> and I'm trying to hurry because I'm hungry too. No, seriously. While we sit in here in our air conditioning and dry and padded chairs and all the things that we have, people around the world don't have the freedom we have. 
but we won't have it much longer. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that prophetically. Not that I want to, but that I have to. So well, what, what does all this have to do with that scroll and those seals? What does all this have to do with God being harsh? How does, what does this have to do with balancing this loving God and this harsh God? Everything. I remember some years ago, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Megan, was in a senior, I think she was a senior in high school, if I remember correctly. And she had done some babysitting and some things like that and made a little money. It was close to Christmas. And she came to me one day and she said, Hey, Dad, said, when you <clears throat> pick me up from school tomorrow, <clears throat> excuse me, will you carry me to this particular store in town? She said, I want to buy something for Mom for Christmas. Sure, you know, I'll do that. So I picked her up and I carried her to the store. And, and it was a nice little store. And for her, what little she had, she was spending a lot. She picks out what she wants to buy her mom for Christmas, and she sits it on the counter. And the lady does her thing and tells her how much it is. And Megan pulls out her, her little wallet, and she starts. And, and I saw the look in her face. She looks where she thought her money was. It wasn't there. So she starts, like we would all do, well, I must have put it here. She starts frantically looking until she realizes her money's gone. Somebody had gone in while they were doing something at school and stole money out of about six or seven girls' pocketbooks. And they had taken Megan's $60. I'm a father. She's standing there with tears in her eyes. Now, obviously, I bought the gift, and, but that didn't change the fact that my daughter, someone had done something to her. And can I just be real blunt and honest with you for a minute? I was mad as hell. If I could have got my hands on whoever did that right then, I would have hurt them bad. I'd at least try. And still to this day, when I think about that and the look on her face and the tears in her eyes, it makes me angry. God's a father. When he sees his children, his people being mistreated, being persecuted, being hurt, he gets mad. It's his love for his children that causes him to be so harsh on the ones who reject being his children. I truly believe that the severity of Revelation's judgments are in direct response to the severe treatment the world has given God's children. Now here again, here in America, it's hard for you to grasp this. A God that loves his children like a father will not allow it to, to go on indefinitely and for them to be mistreated. But again, we don't understand it. Because it hasn't happened. I believe I could probably say in here tonight that 99% of you, that your Christianity didn't cost you a thing. Now, I know we say salvation's free. Okay? But you making the decision to stand up and accept that didn't cost you a penny and hasn't cost you a penny since. That's not the case in much of the world. If you'll allow me to tonight, I want to spend just a few minutes here. I want to tell you some stories. Some stories of people. Now, these stories I didn't get out of a book. These are stories I personally have witnessed and been involved in. I want to share what some of your brothers and sisters around the world face. In 2007, 
December of 2007. In the nation of Kenya, they held presidential elections. They were disputed. And everybody knew beforehand what was going to happen. Violence broke out all across the country. Had nothing to do with the election. Had everything to do with land, but that's just, you know, the way it goes. Violence broke out across the country. For two to three weeks, people were being macheted, hacked to death, even shot. The government did little to stop any of it. Hundreds of thousands were displaced. You say, well, that wasn't religion. Well, it was in a lot of cases. In Africa, tribal religions do not like Christianity because they, you know, they're against them. They take away their power. So anytime they get the opportunity, your tribal religious leaders, and by that I mean voodoo, witchcraft, those things, will take any opportunity they can to persecute Christians. In this particular case, there was a group of thugs, tribal leaders, came through one area, remote area, and they, a group of ladies were there with their children, and they saw them coming, and they ran, and they ran into the church. It was a small church. Probably the whole church was half the size of this room. They ran into this church. These churches are built uh, with just sticks and mud packed on them, but they have stick you know, wooden roof and all this stuff. So they run into the church for protection. 30, 32 people went into the church, women and children. These thugs come up, and they start going into the houses in the little area, and they pull out mattresses, and they lay these old mattresses all up around the church, throw gasoline on them, and set them on fire. The 32 women and children in the church. And they stood outside, and they shouted, We kill Christians. 32 of them burned to death. There were three or four more than that that got away, that were burned severely. The pastor wasn't in the church. He heard what was happening. He came running up, and he uh, was trying to get people out one of the windows. Children were hollering, Pastor, help us. He's trying to get them out, and so they shoot him with bow and arrows until he couldn't do anything else, and they left him for dead. Four days after this happened, I was there. It was actually an Assembly of God church. And I stood in the, the ashes of where this thing had burned. And I'll never forget, there were, there were little pieces of bone where it just burned, human bone. And I traveled from there, and I went to the nearest town where the hospital was, and I, I went in to see the three or four that were burned, and they were burned severely, just Everything bandaged but their eyes mainly. Terrible pain. In hospital conditions, you and I couldn't even, I'd rather be laying on this seat here than laying where they were. All because they were Christians. If they had been tribal religion people, they wouldn't have been hurt. Later that week, I traveled some distance in Kenya to Mount Elgon, the mountain we're talking about building the church on. And we, I, I was with a, a local pastor. We had heard that a village up on the mountain had been attacked. This story, I don't, my wife hasn't even heard this story. I told her last night, I said, I'm going to tell a story or two. Don't talk about them. We'd heard about this village that had been attacked. We decided we'd go check and see what was going on. We made our way toward it. We had to get through two. By this time, the government's getting involved and in setting up roadblocks. And We got through the roadblocks, and we go up to this village. And the reason we knew about this village, it was a Christian village on the mountain. And they were always having a hard time with the others because of the religious beliefs. We drove as far as we could drive up the mountain, and we, we had to stop and walk the last half mile or so, a little dirt trail, and we winding through these little hills, and 
it's kind of like you come between two hills and there's like a little bowl there and this little village is in this, this little bowl valley there, small. I smelled it before I got there. I smelled death. So we got to the village and when I, when I rounded the hill and I looked, I, all around the village were bodies. I don't remember how many, 30, 40 adults. They'd all been hacked with machetes, dead. Been there for a day or two in the hot sun. That was bad enough. But what I saw next, I, there were children. The youngest one, that I, my memory was probably two or three, on up to age maybe six or seven, not older than that. They didn't kill the children. But the children were sitting around on the bodies of their dead parents. They didn't know what to do, where to go. all because they were Christian. Came back down the mountain after doing some things there and trying to get some help up there. At the bottom, the Red Cross had set up a camp, refugee-type camp. And they allowed us to walk into the camp and walk around, and we did. And I remember as I was walking in, on the way in, I saw over to one side a, a blue tarp over big pile of something. I figured it was food, corn, wood, something, you know. As I was coming out, the wind blew and the tarp flipped up and it was probably 50 or 60 bodies. All from Christian villages. Their faith cost them something. 2015, April the 3rd, Garissa University in eastern Kenya. Kids, 18, 20 years old in, in college. Must be the time of your life, right? Al Shabaab, which is an offshoot of Al Qaeda, came over the border from Somalia and they came to Garissa and they went in and killed all the security guards. Then they sought out the Christian students. The Muslim students, they let go. And within four hours, 147 students were dead. The last I heard, about 80 to 90 others have never been found. Probably kidnapped. And who knows what happened. All because they were Christians all because they believed. Or I could switch you over to Pakistan. A little more understandable there, right, an Islamic nation. Most people in the world don't realize it, but there are more than 2 million Christian slaves in Pakistan. You say, why are they slaves? Well, see, if you're a Christian in Pakistan, you can't get a job. Best you might do sweeping the street if you're lucky. So sooner or later, you get in trouble and you need money. And you have to go to one of the Muslims to borrow the money. And in that area that I was in, it's all brickyards. They make bricks by hand. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Slaves, bricks. If you can't pay back the loan after so many months, you have to go to work for the brickyard owner to make bricks to pay off your loan. Well, it's a trap. You can never get out of it. You live in squalor conditions. You, you, it's just horrible. You make bricks in 120 degree temperatures for all day. Your family has to make 2,000 bricks a day. If you don't make 2,000, you get nothing. You make 1,995 and a thunderstorm comes, you've lost everything, you get nothing that day. If the conditions are so bad that 
if you're 50 years old, 45 probably, 45 years old, you are an old man on the brick curve because they die young. Well, that leaves kids. One of the ones I went to, I talked to two of the, the slaves there. <clears throat> they told me the story of their daughter. Happened about a year before. They're Christians, like I said. Their daughter got sick. And if you're on the brickyard and you get sick, you have to get permission from the owner to go to a doctor. In fact, the owner has to give you the money to go to the doctor. So they went to the, the owner of the brickyard and they said, hey, we, uh, her daughter's sick. We need to you know, get her to a doctor. He said, no, go back to work. This went on for two or three days. The girl gets worse and worse. Finally, they go one afternoon and they, they go and they carry the girl with them to the owner. And they're saying, you know, please, please, please let us get her to a doctor. She's very sick. The brickyard owner gets mad. This girl, I'm going to say, was probably seven, eight. He reaches down and he grabs the girl by her ankles, jerks her up, and starts swinging her around like a helicopter by her ankles. And as he's swinging her, he walks over to a stone wall and crashes her head into the wall. I've got a picture of it. I won't show it. It's too... Drops her right where it happened. Looks at those parents, said, now she doesn't need a doctor. Go back to work. All because they were Christians. And then there's Miriam. Some of you have heard the story of Miriam. You've heard me tell it before, but this one is especially close to my heart because, well, let me just read it. This is an email. When we do crusades in Pakistan, we set up generic Gmail addresses so that if people have questions, they can send an email to this generic address. One of the pastors can check it and respond to them. So back in 2018, I had been over there, and several months later, I got this email. And they said that they had received an email from this girl, and they had it translated. They wanted me to see it. This is what this girl wrote. My name's Miriam, and I'm a new Christian. I was in Sahiwal on Friday night before Easter with my friend Sharice. We're both 17 years. Our parents are strict Muslims, and we were told to stay away from the meeting. We wanted to be in the large crowd, so we went away without our parents knowing. We had a real good time singing. It was much different than what we see at our mosque. It was exciting. When the American, that was me, stood to preach, I felt something strange in the air and could not take my eyes off of him as he spoke. His message of God loving me was not like anything I've ever heard. My mom is always telling us <clears throat> that Allah is mad because we're not good Muslims. To hear of a God who loves me and even allowed his son to die for me was shocking to me. Sharice felt the same as I did. At the end of the sermon, the American asked people to stand who wanted to follow this God of love. He explained to us that we must accept his love who came in the form of Jesus. I stood. Sharice also stood beside me. I've never experienced a feeling of love like I did that night. It was amazing. After that night, Sharice and I came together often to discuss what had happened. Because of our strict parents, we could not tell them of our new God. A friend of Sharice, who is a Christian, let us borrow her Bible. The more we read, the more we loved our new God who loved us first. We both talked of telling our parents, but we knew it would be hard. On Monday, Sharice's father found the Bible in her room. He became very angry. He accused her of disgracing the family. He then went and talked with our mom for advice. Tuesday night, as she was sleeping, 
Her father cut her throat. Wednesday morning, he called all of us who are neighbors together and told us that honor had been restored to his family. After the meeting, my father came to me very angry. He asked me if I also had accepted this false God. In my fear, I assured him I had not. I'm not sure if he believed me, but he left me alone. I'm now so ashamed because I lied and did not stand up for Jesus. I'm writing this to ask for your prayers. I've made a decision that tonight I will tell my father the truth. I do not know what will happen, but I cannot deny the God who loves me. Please pray that I will have strength. That night her father cut her throat. What has it cost you to be a Christian? When you hear these stories, and listen, these are mild compared to a lot of things that go on around the world. When you hear these it's, it, and you realize that our God, our Father, is watching all of this. He's watching how his children are being treated around the world. It's a lot easier to understand why sometimes things he does seem so harsh. I believe that the harsh judgments of revelations are at least in part a response to how his children have been treated on this earth. The seals, the judgments to come are horrific in scope. We read it and we really can't even grasp how horrific they are. But more importantly for you and I, it's coming here. Just look at the world around you. It doesn't take much to see it. It's already started. Think about COVID for a moment. Liquor stores were essential. We were not. They're just setting everything up used to be that they blamed everything on white supremacists. Then it turned into nationalist. But have you heard the new term? It's now Christian nationalists are causing all the problems. Satan hates God's children. He hates you. And anything he can do to inflict pain on God by inflicting it on you, he will do. That person that stole my daughter's money caused me pain because it was my baby they messed with. And God feels the same way about you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us, you know, that in the end, perilous times will come. You read that list and you can see most of them in the newspaper tomorrow morning. What's interesting about that list is the word for perilous there in the Greek. It's the Greek word kalepos. It's only used two times in the New Testament. Kalepos times will come. The other time it's used is in Matthew chapter 8. Remember the story when Jesus got in the boat and he went over to the Gadarenes and he got out and the demoniac was there? You remember the description of him? He was so fierce he could break the chains. And When it says fierce there, it's the same word, kalepos. That's the kind of times that are coming. And here's the bottom line. We need to make up our mind where we stand now. I'm going to, going to do one last quick story before we close. Before, before I do that, I need my ushers. I gave them some papers. I want everybody to get one of these papers they're handing out. Get them out as quickly as we can. While they're handing these out, let me, let me tell you the story. A band by the name of M.A. Thomas now known as Bishop Thomas, 
been serving in India for about 50 years. We look at Islamic radicals as a lot of the troublemakers, but in India, it's not. It's the Hindu radicals. They're just as bad as the Islamic radicals. And they'll burn and kill Christians, beat Christians, persecute Christians. Bishop Thomas first went to India, he wasn't sure in India where he was supposed to go. So he put a sign around his neck that said, God loves you, and he started walking across India. And people would see the sign and ask him, what, what do you mean? And he would give him a chance to witness. And he kept walking until he play, came to a place called Kata in India. And something about the place is God said, this is where I want you. So he started ministry in that area. And in the 50 years he's been there, he's planted thousands of churches, many of them in leper colonies. He's all kinds of orphanages, Bible schools, training schools. But as he's gone through that, he's gone through much persecution. They know of 15 times someone tried to assassinate him and he's lived through every one of them. He's been imprisoned many, many times. Beaten many, many times. He walks with a limp from injuries. But he's still there. And he has this Bible school there. <clears throat> And when his students graduate Bible school, before they can graduate, they have to uh, sit down with an interview with him and they have to read through and understand what he calls the martyr's oath. Something he wrote based on scripture. And he has to be assured that as they read this, Adam, that they understand it and they know what they're going into. And then they have to sign it before they can graduate. These men understand their ministry may only be a few days old because they may not live any longer than that. Persecution, martyrdom. So each one of you has a copy of that, I hope, in your hand. That's yours to keep. I'm going to read it. Follow along with me. I am a follower of Jesus. I believe he lived and walked among us, was crucified for our sins, and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. No problem so far, right? I believe he's the king of the earth who will come back for his church. As he was given his life, as he has given his life for me, so I am willing to give my life for him. I will use every breath I possess to boldly proclaim his gospel. Whether in abundance or need, in safety or peril, in peace or distress, I will not, I cannot keep quiet. His unfailing love is better than life, and his grace compels me to speak his name, even if his name costs me everything. In the face of death, I will not deny him. And should shadow and darkness encroach upon me, I will not fear, for I know he is always with me. Though persecution may come, I know my battle is not against flesh, but against the forces of evil. Listen carefully to this one. I will not hate those whom God has called me to love. Therefore, I will forgive when ridiculed, show mercy when struck, and love when hated. I will clothe myself with meekness and kindness so that those around me may see the face of Jesus reflected in me, especially if they abuse me. I have taken up my cross. I have laid everything else down. I know my faith could cost me my life, but I will follow and love Jesus until the end, whenever and however that end may come. 
Should I die for Jesus? I confess that my death is not to achieve salvation, but in gratitude for the grace I've already received. I will not die to earn my reward in heaven, but because Jesus has already given me the ultimate reward in the forgiveness of my sins and the salvation of my soul. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. Amen. I'm not going to ask you to do anything with that. It's yours to keep. But I just wonder how many of us could really read that and sit down and sign it tonight. What if your faith were to all of a sudden cost you something? There's an old Chinese proverb. Some of you are probably wondering where this title up here came from. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, Real gold fears no fire. Some versions of it say true gold, but I like the real. Real gold fears no fire. Fire purifies. That's what persecution does. But every time one of God the Father's sons, one of God the Father's daughters is persecuted, is martyred, I can just see the fist of God clench. That's why sometimes God seems harsh. But he loves his children. Don't mess with them. I'm going to encourage you to take that piece of paper home. Maybe for the next week or so, in your quiet time, in your prayer time, just read it. Ponder on it a little bit. You sign it, that's up to you. I don't, between you and God. But church, we've got to be ready. If, if somebody burst in that door back there tonight, said, I'm going to kill you if you claim Christ, I shudder to think how many would fall away, even in this Wednesday night crowd, because you're not ready for it. Not because you don't believe. We need to be prepared for what's coming. We need to know who we are and where we stand. This whole discussion about the rapture. I've told some of you before, my, my view of the rapture is first load. I'm going to be ready when the first load goes, whenever that is. I'm going to pray real hard that it's pre but I'm going to live that it might be mid or later. I'm going to be prepared. The problem with the pre-rapture, even if it's true, is that so many of you think, well, God's going to take us out before things get bad. No, he never said that. How could you say that to some of the people I just told you about? They didn't get taken out. It makes us Americans so arrogant and proud. I think we're above all that. We'd rather sit on Facebook and play with our little games on Facebook. It tells us how big of a house we're supposed to live in or how fancy a car we're supposed to drive. I believe God wants to give us that. Maybe he does. But if he gave it to me, I wouldn't want it because I know Miriam's, Cherise's, I know pastors that are living in mud houses that only had an ear of corn to eat today. How in the world could I do something like that? Better be ready. Know who you are. Know where you stand.
Father, you are a good, good Father. You love your children beyond anything we can imagine. And I can only imagine how your heart hurts when your children around the world are mistreated by evil, when they're persecuted, tortured, killed. Even so, come Lord Jesus. As John wept over the scroll, Father, may we weep over our brothers and sisters. But may we determine now where we stand. Strengthen us. Show us our weaknesses. Carry us. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for loving us so much sent your son to die in our place. We come into your throne room only by the shed blood of Jesus. But it's that blood that makes us your children. As you go tonight, go in peace. Go in the power of God's love and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Know who you are. Know where you stand. God bless you. Have a great week.